Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on security and compliance for remote federal workers. The emphasis of today's discussion will be on securing those remote endpoints that federal workers are using to do their work and access enterprise applications. Uh, we are certainly living and working in unprecedented times. There are numerous personal and professional inconveniences, even difficulties, and a great deal of uncertainty about the near and long-term future, and your time is valuable. Uh, we, you may have perhaps gained some time back in terms of not having to commute, uh, but certainly how you use that time is at your discretion, and we really appreciate you joining us today. Our agenda today includes a uh, brief overview of the context within which this discussion is taking place and the acceleration of uh, telework and all of its implications. We will then drill into uh, more specifically the challenges associated with securing remote endpoints. Uh, and we will look at compliance requirements and reference frameworks from which we can identify best practices for security and monitoring uh, in this environment. Then we will take a look at some of the technical constraints associated uh, with home environments in particular, and then explore options for continuing to effectively monitor endpoints for security and compliance uh, in these environments. We will conclude with a question and answer period. Uh, please submit questions as you think of them uh, in the chat box, and we will answer those at the conclusion of our presentation. There are two of us online today as your presenters. I'm Maurice Suenuma, VP of Federal and Enterprise at Tripwire, where I've been for the last four years. I was formerly with the Center for Internet Security, as well as Dell and Perot Systems. And I served on the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education Working Group at NIST. I began my career at the U.S. Naval Academy and served for nine years as a Marine Corps Infantry and Special Operations Officer. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Dave Henderson. Hi, my name is David Henderson. I have been a Tripwire engineer for over 10 years. We are very grateful to have you in attendance with us today. It is my hope that the information we provide during today's webcast will be beneficial to you and to your federal workforce. Now, the impetus and context for today's webinar is obvious. There's been a massive and unprecedented shift to telework arrangements uh, for the federal workforce in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, even uh, by the end of March, as you can see in this graphic from the Federal News Network survey, uh, upwards of 78% of respondents were working remotely. Um, this follows uh, mid-March guidance, uh, specifically on March 13th, from the Office of Management and Budget for maximum telework as, a, uh, as the preferred option for uh, federal workers. And so this has been uh, certainly a dramatic shift with the majority of federal employees uh, working remotely, and even 60-plus percent of the Department of Defense is apparently uh, in a telework situation. Um, on March 27th, uh, DOD rolled out the Commercial Virtual Remote Environment, which is a Microsoft Teams-based collaboration suite, uh, in an effort to try to uh, enable that uh, that uh, new arrangement for much of their workforce. This all happened, unfortunately, with minimal planning. Certainly, nobody was planning on a pandemic, and uh, and so that has been uh, uh, a difficulty, a stress, or strain, if you will, on agencies. And at the moment. The duration of this is uncertain. Uh, there are some indications of a potential phase return beginning in the near future, but even then, uh, and in that context, there are certainly unknowns regarding the long-term future and the course that this uh, pandemic will take. And so uh, while telework used to be more of an intermittent, uh, largely optional arrangement uh, in which a lot of non-essential work or tangential work could be done, now, it's quickly become a constant for federal workers. It has certainly been involuntary for many, and all essential work now needs to be uh, com conducted in this type of arrangement. Now, this has certainly had a tremendous impact on the workforce itself. Um, work is no longer uh, just a place in the sense that there was a physical office, a physical facility, 
an in-person environment in which to work. Uh, now there has very quickly been a decoupling of physical space and the and the work itself. And perhaps while the uh, while the place the where the action is or was used to be in an office, uh, now it's increasingly in a uh, virtual uh, environment online. This also means that in terms of the office itself or the immediate physical environment of the federal workers, uh, it is a new environment, oftentimes a home uh, study or office or other uh, place with uh, new processes for getting work done and new office mates in the form of spouses, children, pets, etc. And so this is, of course, uh, something to, to get adjusted to, particularly for those who have not had to uh, telework in the past. Uh, in terms of managing the home office environment, including the local or uh, immediate IT needs in terms of taking care of uh, laptops and managing wireless access points and ensuring network connectivity, that has now shifted to the worker himself or herself, uh, where each worker must manage their uh, home network environment. And all of this is really in many ways a shift uh, in culture and mindset. It's uh, perhaps subtle, but uh, but also profound, and it's uh, causing distributed teams to learn how to or accelerate the learning of and getting better at uh, building trust while distributed and remote, communicating effectively uh, and maintaining or even improving productivity uh, while uh, dis dispersed. And it is in many ways a, a mental shift as well in terms of not just the physical boundaries, but also the time boundaries. Uh, it's a shift from clocking in, if you will, to round-the-clock availability, and, uh, and it changes uh, how we all, as remote workers, tend to view work. The interesting thing here, of course, is that this may, in some ways, be the beginning of a new normal. We don't know exactly what that new normal will look like, uh, but this acceleration and this change and this forcing of adaptation to telework environments uh, will likely have many uh, impacts to the workforce itself that we will uh, continue to observe and learn in the coming months and years. And meanwhile, there's been a tremendous impact to the enterprise uh, itself. Uh, many agencies that to date have been uh, expanding telework options, perhaps slowly but surely, or in very segmented uh, ways, and perhaps uh, assuming that some parts of work would never be available for telework uh, are now accelerating uh, very much in that direction. Uh, there are critical internal government functions from sensitive communications to acquisition activities that have had to shift over to telework, uh, as well as essential uh, public-facing citizen services at agencies such as uh, the IRS, the Social Security Administration, and VA Healthcare. Um, in response to this, there's been an all-hands-on-deck effort by uh, the IT leadership, uh, not least of which is the Telework Readiness uh, Task Force led by the DOD CIO across the services, DISA, and other DOD components uh, to, uh, to address these needs. In some ways, this has uh, simply accelerated the modernization initiatives that uh, have already been underway, and those that uh, were already completed, such as the Air Force's a cloud and Office 365 environments have been put to good use. Uh, the Navy, uh, in turn, has been in the midst of a, a network modernization effort, and these are now being accelerated uh, to support uh, to support the new uh, workforce needs. Uh, so a lot of changes, uh, a lot of changes going on with uh, within the agencies themselves, and really uh, this has meant a shift in the definition of the enterprise environment itself from being largely contained within on-premises data centers or uh, agency managed and provisioned cloud environments or uh, agency offices and facilities uh, to rapidly expand outward to include small office home environments uh, or small office home office uh, environments that are effectively managed uh, by the federal workers as, as, uh, as private and personal spaces, uh, not agency facilities. And so, uh, this has also led to um, uh, what might likely be a new normal in terms of uh, what and how the federal workforce uh, engages in its efforts and in its critical work uh, going forward. There will be uh, shifts back, uh, needless to say, in terms of back to the office, but uh, a lot of these IT modernization efforts 
will certainly remain in place going forward. And so there will be a new normal uh, for the enterprise itself uh, going forward as well. And as we know, one of the greatest challenges to security and compliance in this uh, brave new world is in securing uh, the endpoints themselves. Uh, there are challenges that range from asset management in terms of proper inventory and control over both agency-owned and bring-your-own device uh, devices that uh, may be allowed to connect to agency networks. There's the provisioning and support of those assets. Uh, there are, uh, in many cases, network limitations in terms of just the bandwidth uh, itself. Uh, for example, the U.S. Navy has already increased its uh, available bandwidth for remote users 150% uh, to 250,000 users and still experiencing some constraints and working actively to uh, to expand that and, and to ensure the security of those connections um, is, is also important in terms of allowing encrypted transmission. Typically, VPN, as we know, uh, virtual private networks are used to ensure uh, the security of a, an encrypted tunnel over whatever and through whatever the connection may be. Uh, this is uh, also constrained, and this is actually one of the great uh, limitations, one of the great constraints that uh, we hear of uh, our agency customers uh, running into. And so we will discuss that as one of the key technical challenges and constraints uh, here shortly. Uh, but that remains, a, uh, that, mean, that remains certainly a major factor in securing uh, remote endpoints. Uh, being able to apply proper controls and safeguards to those endpoints themselves is a challenge with less uh, visibility and control uh, and the fact that these, uh, these remote devices may be used more often for uh, personal use. And so there is a kind of a new uh, uh, or expanded um, insider threat risk, if you will, uh, as well as the uh, possible exposure of insecure or less secure home network environments. Ultimately, agencies are, of course, struggling to um, uh, and need to uh, ultimately have visibility into and monitoring of those endpoints uh, to know what's happening in terms of system state, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, configurations, and activities and changes on those endpoints. Securing remote endpoints is a top priority to all organizations. In today's world, you cannot be careful enough. Introducing good security hygiene is always essential to success. Working from home or in a remote setting can intensify risks beyond what may have been seen on your federal infrastructure. We have heard of phishing emails, and we can identify and report on them as best we can. But there are other threat indicators that we must also be aware of. Let's face it, while at home and while we're on our government-owned laptops or workstations, we may not be able to resist the urge to disconnect the VPN and surf the web, watch a few videos, download some interesting apps, engage in fantasy sports, or online gaming. Users should be aware of indicators of compromise, such as unusually slow computers or loss of mouse and keyboard use. Bad actors out there would love to be able to take control of your system through remote code execution vulnerabilities or other yet-to-be-discovered zero-day malicious behaviors. So how then do we secure those remote endpoints? And to that end, we can and should turn to commonly referenced security standards and frameworks. Much of the uh, cybersecurity best practices that we uh, can identify are highlighted in those uh, frameworks. and. So they provide effective guidance on, uh, on those methods necessary to ensure security and compliance. Uh, and we really should begin uh, at, a, at a minimum with some of the compliance requirements as identified in FISMA or HIPAA or CMMC, as well as department and agency uh, specific policies. These are uh, by nature required and thus uh, something that must be tackled right away. But more broadly, when we look to uh, secure the enterprise holistically uh, and also to even meet the compliance requirements, uh, many of the specific technical controls for those frameworks are derived from some of these uh, reference frameworks, including the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, uh, the NIST uh, Special Publication 800 series with many technical controls, uh, and the CIS controls from the Center for Internet Security. 
Uh, if we look at the NIST cybersecurity framework as kind of an organizing framework uh, for security strategy at the enterprise level, uh, then we can look at the NIST uh, 800 series publications as really a series of uh, detailed technical standards. Uh, the CIS controls in many ways serve as a uh, operational level set of controls um, under which tech specific subcontrols and technical standards are grouped and which in turn can be mapped uh, to the NIST cybersecurity framework. So very quickly, we can identify a set of uh, existing standards and frameworks that have over the years proven to be effective in ensuring security and compliance uh, as, the, as the place to start. Uh, furthermore, uh, we see some telework-specific guidelines. Uh, very recently, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at the Department of Homeland Security has published its Trusted Internet Connection 3.0 uh, Supplemental Guidance for Telework. Uh, and in that guidance, uh, we see um, a variety of con uh, uh, security controls, many of which, uh, as mentioned before, map right back to NIST and CIS and so forth. Uh, for example, within its universal security capabilities list, uh, we see controls such as configuration management, uh, vulnerability assessment, dynamic uh, threat detection, um, strong authentication, uh, uh, backup and, and recovery of data and so forth. And so there are some uh, agency guidance uh, and guidelines that are available. Uh, and then if we look at the home environment, uh, I might call attention to the CIS controls telework and small office network security guide. Uh, these are guidelines for securing small office and home office environments and include some very basic uh, uh, guidance on how to properly uh, purchase, uh, set up, um, and devices as well as uh, network settings and encryption standards and so forth that uh, each uh, federal worker can apply to his or her home environment to ensure a secure network. And so taken together, uh, we already have um, a rich body of uh, works that are, uh, that are available to guide us through this in terms of securing, uh, securing and remote endpoints. Now, for any enterprise, in order to really prioritize our efforts and focus our attention on those uh, essential, those most basic controls that will have the greatest impact to security and compliance, then we can look at really a distilled set of controls from the aforementioned frameworks uh, that help us guide our actions. Um, among those include uh, some of the most essential critical security controls, such as asset inventory, uh, secure configuration management, vulnerability management, and audit logging and change control. And interestingly enough, these are uh, just as applicable to workstations and remote laptops as they are to servers and databases and network devices in large data center environments and in cloud environments. And so really, this is less about doing something fundamentally different and more about doing the same essential uh, security basics in a different environment. And uh, just as importantly, perhaps even more importantly, is to not just do the basics, uh, but to do them well. And so how then do we uh, successfully implement these controls and properly secure remote endpoints for federal employees uh, in a maximum telework environment in the constraints that we see presented in home environments. Technical constraints to good security hygiene can include a lack of tool diversity. Am I really secure? Bandwidth constraints due to oversubscription of available VPN services. Do we plan for an explosion of remote user activity? Can't connect or drop connections? Have we considered how well our VPN network can scale? Installed tools will only function over secure VPN. Are we being short-sighted and thinking VPN access was all we needed for remote security hygiene? Alternatives to VPNs for security hygiene are not available. For example, can your tools utilize a SOC 5 proxy? Some best practices for good security hygiene include ensuring the tools you have in place do a great job of keeping remote systems secure. This includes making sure the installed tools can utilize alternative methods of connectivity, such
such as SOX5 proxies, and making sure that your tools run connectionless. Do not require a constant connection back to the mothership. Types of security I should consider and always think about include malware detection, baselining the integrity of an endpoint operating system, keeping my endpoints hardened and compliant, waiting and watching for undesirable activity, maintaining an accurate and complete hardware and software inventory, and ensuring I have a good log collection routine in place. Perhaps one of the key pieces of security I need to consider is the ability to perform client-end vulnerability management scans, scheduled, and off-net. In summary, have I thought all of my endpoint security options through? Are my remote assets properly secured? Do the remote security connectivity options provide access to my security controls and collected data? Do I need alternative connectivity methods? With Tripwire products and services, you can rest assured that our client software is working to keep your endpoints secure and that we do not rely solely on VPN connectivity to forward critical security information. Examples can include change assessment data, current compliance scoring, lossless log collection, or vulnerability scoring information. Tripwire extends SOX5 proxy connectivity to the endpoint. Be confident that just as your customer-facing web servers in the DMZ today are protected using SOX5 proxy connection options, so are your remote endpoints. All right, thank you, Dave. And now let's turn our attention to some of the questions that many of you have uh, submitted during our presentation, and we'll begin to answer them. Hey, good afternoon. This is Dave Henderson with Tripwire. Thank you very much for uh, joining the webcast today. We're very appreciative of that. I'm going to start out by reading off a couple of questions that uh, look like have shown up in the chat window. And the first question is, what should you do if technical constraints um, provide such of a, I mean, really are giving you problems? Let's say that they, the word in the question does suck. <laughs> As lack of bandwidth for remote access continues to persist while working remotely. And, you know, that's a good question. and. Um, I believe the webcast is more along security today, but let's talk about that a little bit. And organizations really should be considering moving critical applications and file shares to cloud or hosted type facilities away from their organization, um, their on-prem organization. Utilizing SSL-based connectivity apps for cloud and SaaS offerings, and you can do a Google on VPN alternatives, and you'll find out that there's several of them out there. Uh, but make better use of secure SSL-based cloud storage, such as Google Docs or OneDrive. Those are also great options. And ensuring that secure services that uh, utilize, um, in any case, multi-factor authentication or dual-factor authentication, obviously making sure those are in place. In those particular situations, you may be using an SSL secure-based uh, connectivity product that's not a VPN. But once you connect to that endpoint um, application, whether it be in the cloud or whether it be on-prem, you should be presented with a multi-factor authentication or dual-factor authentication process to make sure that you're um, a valid user and that your communication is secure and um, encrypted. And then I would say as another alternative, you might be looking at using a split tunnel type VPN. And if you're not familiar with that, a split tunnel type VPN takes traffic that's destined, let's say, to your corporate network and actually puts it on the VPN, but any other traffic that might be destined to some location that's completely off net, that's not work related, and push that traffic out the normal uh, channels to the, um, to the um, actual web. So I would say that in that particular case, if you're using a split tunnel, not something that's easy to configure for the endpoint user, but it's something that your IT and security department would uh, set up and configure prior to or remotely configure for you in this case if you're working remotely today. But that's something that they should consider 
having pre-configured in the future. Uh, the second question that I see that came up here is um, along the lines of what unique security challenges might enterprises face with workers who are using their own devices to connect to an enterprise network? Okay, so if you're using your own device to connect to an enterprise network, what challenges might an organization such as government agency face in that case? And well, you're really opening yourself up to a, a can of worms. I'm going to start out there. But indicators of potential threats that an organization or a government agency may face if users are using their own equipment would be new programs that may appear that were not installed okay, by the uh, agency. And so you don't obviously don't want to see that stuff on the uh, corporate network or on the agency network if it's uh, something that's you know blacklisted. Uh, computer slowdown, okay, strange pop-up ads appearing on your screen, or loss of control of your mouse or keyboard, phishing attacks where you're using a something like an Outlook client to connect to an Outlook server, which, by the way, bypasses VPN, has its own connectivity methods. Um, you may see phishing emails, and in that situation, a phishing email is obviously a, a scam to try to pull personal information from you that they may be able to utilize in uh, you know future scam rings. Okay, so if you get an email that looks exactly like it came from your boss or it's official, it looks just like it came from within your organization, one of your better practices is to hover over any links and see whether or not the link is pointing to you to a valid location. And so be aware of phishing locations. Another thing you may see is rats, remote access trojans. Okay, those are uh, trojans that like to take screenshots of where you're at. And they may even download files. And they may be themed with a COVID-19 type theme, since that's what we're dealing with today. A remote access Trojan is something that could end up on that endpoint. You don't even know it's there. And it's taking screenshots in the background or downloading your files, et cetera. So you want to be aware of that. And then there's uh, key logging. Okay, key logging malware or spyware. That's uh, something that uh, has been around for a long time, but it's software that sits in the background and actually captures your keystrokes. And that's important because if you're typing in passwords, that type of software can capture your passwords. And of course, then there's a, another old adage is malware that's embedded in Office macros. So if you have any type of um, software, such as a Excel spreadsheet, and it's got macros enabled in it, you may want to consider disabling macros in your spreadsheets to make sure that if there is any malware in there, it's not, um, it, it doesn't, uh, it's not accessed, okay? So a best practice, okay, in remote use, don't mix personal computers or personal use with work use. So your employees out there should use their work devices to do work and their personal devices for personal matters. So you would want to install for instance, um, a service while you're at the office that um, is not related to work, and so don't do it at home. So that's something that uh, is just a general best practice. If you've got a work laptop, use it only for work purposes. Okay, I think that hopefully that answers those two questions. Does yeah, Dave, I would just, uh, good, good thoughts yeah. there, and I would just add, I think, there, and underscore the fact that I think the challenge we're wrestling with here is uh, is that um, that in many ways the folks responsible for agency uh, cybersecurity lose uh, lose even more control in the in this scenario, right? So previously, there were, uh, for the most part the network was secured, maintained by uh, by the enterprise, and in uh, and in most cases the devices as well. Um, and there was uh, a higher degree of visibility into those devices. There was always a concern, and always will be, of kind of human behavior in terms of the worker and what he or she is doing um, on that device, uh, as well as their uh, resistance to phishing attacks and so forth. But now we, we start complicating the situation, right, with um, uh, potentially bring your own devices, uh, working in home environments where, as you, as you pointed out, Dave, um, very well, uh, it could be mixed personal and professional use. And then the network itself is extended. And so now, now uh, we have to kind of fret about uh, our, you know, essential firewall capabilities available uh, at the uh, uh, at the router within the home environment, 
uh, more than likely not. And so um, uh, it becomes, it compounds the problem, it extends the, uh, the perimeter out, it makes the, the perimeter more porous, um, and it introduces uh, uh, new attack vectors with this ever-expanding attack surface. Uh, so all the more reason why uh, the, 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 one of the central themes here is uh, being able to, as an enterprise, uh, gain and maintain visibility of those remote endpoints uh, so that uh, as uh, these devices and the workers using them are going about their day, as, uh, as things happen, whether intentionally or unintentionally, uh, the enterprise is at least aware of it. And I think that's one of the points that you were making, Dave, in the latter part of the uh, presentation pre-Q&A, that uh, there are, in fact, ways to do that. There are, in fact, ways to uh, uh, gain, gain and maintain visibility into the assets themselves, uh, perform vulnerability scans, perform configuration checks, and look for essentially unauthorized and uh, malicious changes. Thank you, Maurice. And that's absolutely true. One of the things that I wanted to draw out with uh, the Tripwire Enterprise Solutions or the Tripwire IP360 Vulnerability Management Solutions or our, even our Log Management Solutions is uh, with Tripwire Enterprise and Tripwire Log Center, you have the ability to use a SOX 5 proxy. And uh, so that type of communication actually occurs over the public internet. So if I've got those applications installed on my endpoint, then rest assured, I am looking at change that might be happening on the endpoint, behavioral analytics that are happening on my endpoint. I'm capturing that data, and then I'm forwarding that data up to my primary security servers, which are behind my firewall and my corporate network, let's say, via a SOC 5 proxy. So I don't require that VPN connectivity. So even if my VPN is completely disconnected, Rest assured, the Tripwire security software is still doing its job and still forwarding information up to the agency servers, okay? So uh, that's critical to understand that um, those endpoints are being monitored by clients that are keeping them secure and alerting when things such as those items we talked about earlier, uh, new files being dropped on machines, new executables showing up, and being exploded, new ports being opened, new software, uh, new processes, new services, anything related to cybercrime, we're going to pick that stuff up and we'll forward those notifications up to uh, the corporate network, but we don't require a VPN for that to happen. So you can use those software applications knowing the endpoints are going to remain secure and not have to be concerned about the fact that my VPN is overloaded, oversubscribed, and unable to attach. Okay, so that's the, that's kind of the theme of where we're going today. Are there any other questions? One of the other things, Maurice, that I'd like to mention is um, a lot of the Tripwire customers, a customer base today, have customer-facing web servers. And um, so let's say that I am one of a big government agency and I've sent out links to the public if you want to access this and go and click this link. And uh, for instance, you know, checking on whether or not you're getting some COVID-19 paycheck, okay, from the government. So you click on a link and it takes you to a customer-facing web portal, okay? So you're not going into that agency's back-end infrastructure. You're on a customer-facing web server that's on the front end or outside what we call the DMZ. Okay, so how do I keep that software, including your PII data that you might enter, secure? So what happens is with the Tripwire products is once you connect to that customer portal, okay, that's customer facing, we have our software installed on that web server. So we're monitoring, we're capturing, we're looking for things that are nefarious, malicious, but that traffic that we uh, may need to, if we need to make a notification or we see something that changes that's critical, we pass that again through the firewall to the back end of your infrastructure via SOX 5 proxy. So all we're saying is we can take that same type of technology and extend it all the way out to the endpoint and uh, utilize it on laptops and work-based stations in a remote environment. Uh, so. Um, do we have any other questions? 
Yeah, it looks that way, uh, Dave. Um, here's one question. Uh, one of the main components of Tripwire is FIM, or File Integrity Monitoring. How is this addressed in remote worker environments? Yep, again, um, File Integrity Management is the ability to uh, monitor key components of the operating system and key applications that are running on the application on that remote endpoint. And so what Tripwire Enterprise does is it keeps an eye on all those applications and all those key components. And if it sees something that changes, in other words, we, we, before we even begin the process, we baseline those endpoints so we know what they should look like, okay, and all those apps, all those files, all, those, all the configuration. So if we see something changing, and uh, the, our endpoint client, which has a hook to the kernel and listens to system calls, will see that change, and that's the type of notification that we're going to send over a SOC 5 proxy up to the security system back at the agency where it then alerts the administrative and the security staff of the incident. Okay, so that's that's how we handle them on the endpoints. And okay, and so we have another question here from um, Albert. And Albert's asking what are the names of the Tripwire security products for endpoints? And uh, so the three primary products that we're talking about here our Tripwire Enterprise, which is what's going to provide your file integrity management and your system integrity management, your cybercrime controls. Okay? And uh, the second product, the Tripwire Log Center, which is a client that's collecting logs in a lossless fashion in real time on those endpoints. So, And if it doesn't currently have connectivity for whatever reason back to the uh, corporate or agency infrastructure, then it will cache that log data and throttle it up once it's uh, reestablished a TCP connection and a secure TCP. <clears throat> Again, that can use a SOC 5 proxy. And then we have uh, Tripwire IP360, which is our vulnerability management solution, and that also has a client on the endpoint. And with that particular solution, you can have it schedule scans that run throughout the 24-hour day. And uh, so those are scheduled scans that are scheduled disconnected, okay, scans that we configured to have those agents run vulnerability, full vulnerability scans on the endpoints, let's say, every few hours, and, uh, and then forward that information up to our vulnerability network exposer or vulnerability manager up at the uh, corporate or agency headquarters or on-prem environment. So that's the three primary products that we're talking about on the endpoint. And um, it looks like we have another question from Tim Allen. Tim's asking, do you have a white paper available for attendees that addresses these remote work security considerations? And I would say, yes, we do. We have a white paper, and uh, we have data sheets, and we also have a data security blog. So if you go to tripwire.com and look at, click on the link that says data security, you can go to our blogs, and you'll see uh, blog components out there on working remotely and securely. And I'm looking at another question here that comes from Seshi. And Seshi's asking, what is the difference between FIM functionality and Tripwire Change Auditor feature available in Tripwire Enterprise Console? Okay, so um, FIM, which we described earlier, is a product of, of Tripwire Enterprise that's looking at files, the integrity of the operating system and the applications that are running on it to make sure that they're not being tweaked or changed or modified. And uh, I'm assuming you're talking about the Tripwire Change Auditor feature that you're actually talking about compliance. And um, so on the endpoint, Tripwire's client, Tripwire Enterprise client, is also running your checks, such as your CIS check or your DISSYSTIG check or your NIST 853 check, et cetera. And so if we're seeing any changes that are happening on the endpoints that impact the compliance state or the hardening state of your endpoint, then Tripwire forwards, again, that information up and into the agency or corporate infrastructure. And, of course, that adjusts the compliance scoring and sends notifications to the security team that, hey, somebody's made changes to a security control and uh, that need to be looked at. So hopefully that yeah, answers add, the question. Yeah, I might add, Dave, that uh, there are uh, many different ways to perform um, uh, system uh, configuration checks and uh, against various configuration standards and, and policies, um, DISA STIGs, for example, CIS security benchmarks, and those that are uh, often modified for 
uh, specific enterprise um, use. Um, and those scanning capabilities are often found in products that do vulnerability scanning at the same time. Now, as you heard Dave describe, right, we also do vulnerability scanning. So certainly that side-by-side -side capability is there. But one of the benefits I would just like to underscore of having integrity monitoring and secure configuration management and policy checks integrated in a single platform is it helps to uh, minimize configuration drift. So while we typically see um, uh, enterprises of all kinds, including federal agencies, um, ramp up their uh, compliance efforts, if you will, and ensure that systems are uh, configured properly, et cetera, in time for audits and internal checks. Uh, over time, either uh, from uh, just unintentional uh, changes or routine approved work that are necessary for enterprise functionality, um, the actual uh, the actual uh, state of compliance of that particular uh, endpoint may drift kind of away from that uh, uh, that last assessed score. And so uh, by having integrity monitoring integrated, uh, you can check uh, frequently or as frequently as real time uh, to continue to, to assess against the standard and thus know if you're drifting away from a, uh, a desired state. Okay, thanks for that, Maurice. I'm also looking at a question here from Nancy, and Nancy's asking if we have uh, Tripwire Enterprise, do we just add an agent to the desktops that would be a client to make them secure? And that's part of it. Uh, generally, in a typical pre-deployment or pre-remote deployment um, situation, the security team or the IT teams are going to have those clients pre-installed on the laptops that are sent out or checked out into the environment. And those laptops will have a pre-set uh, configuration such as they run in real time. And um, if they do run in real time, then they're looking at specific components of the operating system or the applications in real time. If they're not running in real time, then they have the uh, a specific set of uh, scheduled tasks that will uh, run throughout the day or maybe once a day to check to see whether or not those endpoints are actually secured. So, can you do it, uh, add the agent on the endpoint and set that agent up to tell it what it's actually configuring after the fact, after the systems have been remotely deployed? Absolutely, because if I install that agent remotely, then I can go into, it's going to check, it's gonna call home, check into uh, the console uh, back at headquarters and the security team at, from that point will take over to apply the proper rules, proper tasks and configuration to that agent. see any other questions, but does anybody else have any other questions? If you do, feel free to ask. You can add them to the uh, chat client in the webcast if you wish. Looks like we've got another question that came in here from Albert. And Albert's act asking, do you have a cloud-based CE Tripwire Enterprise to manage and monitor our endpoints? And I would say that Tripwire Office offers a managed service, um, a SaaS application that has the ability to provide staff and software right out of the cloud to manage your infrastructure. And of course that uh, relieves um, managers and um, IT and security staff, excuse me, IT and security management staff from having to deploy or software one and resources two. So yes, we do have that service available as an expert op solution, primarily today utilized by the commercial um, markets and uh, from a government perspective, the expert ops application that I just mentioned as a SaaS, uh, we're uh, actually standing that up as we speak. Okay, so the reason why we don't use the same SaaS cloud that the commercial market uses is the federal market needs to be FedRAMP certified. So once that FedRAMP certification is attained, which we expect very shortly, then you'll see those managed SaaS applications available to our, our federal customers. Okay, so we have another question from Steshi. Does Tripwire Connect product provide a unified interface to integrate the file integrity monitoring and the security configuration compliance data captured in Tripwire Enterprise? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, we have two versions of Tripwire Connect. Tripwire Connect is a single pane of glass reporting, analytics, and visualization platform that allows Tripwire products to forward 
uh, collected information and data to a single server, and that single server then um, integrates, I should say, um, aggregates is a better word, uh, vulnerability data and change and compliance data into one single pane of glass. Okay, so you can go to that one web page, which can be either hosted in a cloud as a SaaS offering or installed on-prem behind your firewall. And uh, so once you go to that particular uh, Tripwire Connect page, then you can see an aggregation of all of your Tripwire deployments and um, you know from a single pane of glass. So the answer to that is yes. And then we have Nancy asking another question. How does Tripwire secure the laptop without slowing down the network? And um, uh, so I'm going to assume that you're saying, how do we secure the laptops without slowing down the VPN? Okay. And because we're talking about using a SOX 5 proxy, <clears throat> Tripwire clients are, um, and, and I'm going to um, say that, um, emphasize, I should say, that if, when selecting a virtual private network, that those VPNs should be set up to, um, or that ver as split tunnel VPNs. Okay, so that's the best choice because in that situation, then if I've got uh, corporate or government-based traffic that's headed to some application that I use on a daily basis to more perform my job, that should go over that VPN. But if I'm looking at traffic uh, that's going to the public internet or in this case, security software that's, that's headed out of my endpoint where, for instance, I want to send up some alerts on some data that I've captured that's important, then I can utilize the route that takes me out over the public internet to connect to my SOX 5 proxy and get that information into my back end without impacting my VPN. So hopefully that answers that question. And then we've got a follow-up from Seshi. Does the DevOps security solution provide, provided by Tripwire or is it FedRAMP certified? If not, any tentative timeline for getting the certification? So Tripwire DevOps, if those for those that haven't heard of that, is a SaaS solution that Tripwire has developed that in, um, inserts our security solutions into your CI CD development process. And currently, the uh, DevOps SaaS cloud is not FedRAMP certified, but again, like I mentioned earlier that our expert ops um, SaaS offering will be FedRAMP certified uh, fairly shortly. And on the heels of that will become some of our other SaaS offerings such as Tripwire DevOps. So today it's not FedRAMP certified, but that's coming shortly. And then we've got a question here from Jillian. And Jillian's asking, does Tripwire provide any automatic remediation, or are these reports just sent to the administrator and left up to there to discretion whether to act or not. Okay, so Tripwire Enterprise does in fact support automatic remediation. And in many cases we provide the actual remediation scripts required to fix a, uh, a compliance problem. So let's say that I'm using the DISA STIGs or NIST 853 or I'm doing maybe one of our newer CMMC policy, cyber security maturity model. And I'm running that, and I find out that out of, and I'm just going to make this simple, out of 10 tests, I failed one. Okay, so how do I remediate that one failed test? With our products, you can insert the script. If it's not there yet, okay, you can insert your own script, or you can uh, utilize the scripts that we provide to uh, set up a workflow that automatically will ultimately automatically remediate that for you. And I say a workflow because the U.S. government does not like individuals going onto a server or using a security application and clicking on the big, fat, easy button or fix me button, okay? The government has processes, and those usually include going to a change review board and getting approval to make those changes and fix those security controls, which could be uh, the fix maybe that I need to make a change to my group policy on an Active Directory server, or if it's Linux, I may have to go to the Etsy folder and change a configuration file. But the fact is we generally are going to get approval to do that first. So with Tripwire Enterprise, if you've got things that need to be auto-remediated, we have a workflow built into the product that allows you to click on a button that says Open Work Order. And when you open that work order, it's going to pass the request to auto-remediate to whoever in your environment has the um, authorization to approve auto-remediation. And that's generally somebody that's very familiar with hardening 
because you know you don't want to approve somebody to auto remediate something if you think that that security control change may break an application. Okay, so you want to make sure that when you approve something of that nature, that it's an approval that can be put in place without any impact to the server or the network. And so once I've approved that, then there's a third part of that workflow that says, okay, I've approved it. I'm going to pass that on to my individual on my team who has the right to actually do the remediation. So that's like a third set of eyes. So that third guy looks at it and says, okay, this has been approved, and I do agree. It's not going to cause a problem, so I'm going to go ahead and hit this remediate button. So the third guy has the ability to hit the remediate button. For everybody else, that remediate button may be grayed out. Okay? So anyway, the answer to that is yes. And Nancy has a follow-on. Can all tripwire solutions run with or without an agent? And what are the benefits of the agent? Okay, so um, all three of the products that we're talking about from a core perspective can definitely run with an agent client. And the benefits to using an agent client are primarily around the fact that I've got, and our agent clients anyway, they're all lossless. Okay, so they don't require, they're connectionless. Okay, so they do not require a connection to the mothership, so to speak. Okay, so the agents can run standalone. And when they're running standalone, then whatever they're authorized to do, okay, they're going to do, such as a Tripwire Enterprise agent may be set to be a real-time agent, meaning that it's got the authorization to monitor critical, missing critical components of the operating system in your applications in real time. And while it's doing that work, if it doesn't have a connection, remember it's connectionless, it will, like I said earlier, it will cache that data. And then when it does establish a TCP connection or route out to the internet, then through the SOX5 proxy, it will forward or throttle that information up to the mothership where the uh, uh, security team will handle it from there. So that includes opening, sending alerts, sending emails, taking actions. We haven't even talked about that. Our products have the ability to, if something really critical happened on an endpoint, we have the ability to actually isolate that endpoint, take it off net. Okay, so anyway, hopefully that answers that solution. Uh, lossless, agentless, or excuse me, lossless, connectionless, standalone. Those are the three keywords there. And it looks like we're caught up on the questions. Um, if anybody else has a question, please enter it or let us know and we'll answer it. Do you have any follow-up on those, Maurice, that you'd like to mention? Um, none. Uh, no follow-up on either specific questions. I think you answered them uh, very well, Dave. I, I was just thinking through kind of this, this theme of dealing with network constraints and still achieving um, endpoint security. And just wanted to kind of highlight again the, the point uh, that, uh, that we, that there is a difference, right, between the network architecture and the network security measures that are taken uh, and the endpoint monitoring measures that are implemented. So what we're talking about here is uh, doing what is always good to do on endpoints in terms of uh, in terms of visibility into the endpoint uh, in terms of vulnerability scanning and policy checks and uh, integrity monitoring and just doing that in a different type of a, a network uh, architecture <clears throat> and so the VPN is brought up uh, because that tends to be uh, both a necessary network security control but also can be a constraint um, but we sh we sh uh, I want to make sure that we're not getting um, Kind of tied up in in mixing the two the two efforts, right? Um, in the in the sense that as they described, we can maintain visibility into the endpoint and should be doing so regardless of uh, of the network architecture. So, uh, referring back to the CISA a Trusted Internet Connections 3.0 Interim Telework Guidance, right? They uh, they outline alternate um, security patterns for for teleworkers accessing various resources, right? In this, in this case, cloud resources. Um, there's the kind of traversing through the, uh, the enterprise environment or the agency campus and, you know, policy, policies can be enforced there, et cetera. Uh, they might access through, the agency teleworker may access through a CASB, cloud access security broker uh, type of a platform, or in fact may access a cloud security provider directly. Um, and so 
depending on the network architecture, there are different network security controls that the that the agency has to worry about and implement and monitor. Uh, the nice thing about uh, about the uh, endpoint monitoring solutions that we discussed is that that can be those can be implemented and consistently monitored, kind of regardless of the network architecture and ultimately what sort of enterprise assets are being accessed by those endpoints, whether on premises or uh, or in the cloud. It looks like we have one more question, Dave. Uh, can you talk about how Tripwire interacts with common workflow ticketing systems once security issues are discovered on remote systems? Okay, yes. And that's a very good question. It comes from Tim. And so, Tim, to answer that question, we have uh, Tripwire Enterprise includes several add-on applications. And some of those add-on applications might be like the whitelist profiler. Another one might be what we call dynamic software reconciliation, which automatically adjusts change that has been picked up by the endpoint based on whether or not it was a patch change or not, okay? Very critical application. And then we have another one called Event Sender. Event Sender packages up um, data that Tripwire Enterprise has collected, not just event data, but who made the change type data, content data, any other data that we've collected around a change into what we call a super event and forwards that in the required format to the log management uh, solution of choice. So, for instance, if you were uh, using um, a product called ArcSight in your environment for log management, then we would make sure that those um, super events were in CEF format okay, to uh, match what ArcSight requires. And then the the, the app of choice, which you're asking the question about, would be called Tripwire Event Integration Framework, and or TEIF for short. And that has the ability to interface to uh, systems like ServiceNow, Remedy, CheckIt, Jira, uh, CA Service Desk, and there's many of them out there. And what happens is it gives you the ability to not only open up incidents when things occur, uh, that are not approved, but it gives us the ability to designate between an authorized change versus an unauthorized change. So let's say that Susan A logs into her laptop <clears throat> and makes a change to a security control, and um, and then what happens is we pick that change up, and then we'll query the ITSM database for whichever change ticketing system you're using to see whether or not the change Susan A made was approved. It was approved, and we'll insert the change uh, review approval number or approval ID into the change and do what we call a promotion. So we'll make that change the next baseline or the new baseline for that specific element that she made a modification to. Now, if we do a query of that ITSM database and we find that the match was not there, that it was an unapproved change, then we notify proper personnel of the um, of the change to alerts, and we can also optionally open a ticket in that ticketing. So, hope that answers that, Tim. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Um, Maurice, you, would you like to make any closing comments? Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to, to join us today. Um, these are uh, interesting, relevant, timely issues. But uh, uh, And, of course, uh, Dave and I love talking about this, these topics, but we also know that you have uh, many demands on your time and many options for webinars and webcasts these days. So thank you all for joining. Uh, very much, and uh, we look forward to continue to partner with you um, as you see fit to support your security and compliance needs and uh, wish you the very best for the rest of this day and uh, the rest of this week. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone.